the title that I that I put was retrieving information from complex data, classifying Parkinson's related variables using the goalkeeper game. So what's what's in the title? We will use the goalkeeper game, which I will explain shortly. Uh, and our goal was to understand what's what type of predictive power the goalkeeper game had uh, for some variables that are related to Parkinson's disease. And why, why do we have this uh, initial part of the title, retrieve information from complex data? The problem is, is that the type of data that we get in the goalkeeper game, uh, it's, it's not in the standard form that we usually use in statistics in, in the tabular form. It's, it's kind of like several time series for each uh, participant. So it's uh, very high dimensional and the problem, and, and each observation is very, has very weak information. So the problem is how do we extract meaningful variables from the goalkeeper game in such a way that we can use to, to predict variables that are related to Parkinson's disease. So this, this paper uh, was, uh, uh, we, we did the research with several people. So, some of them are here. Uh, the, uh, I, uh, I participated and also Mateus uh, and Maria Elisa, uh, uh, who works in uh, physio physiotherapy. Uh, Yanina and Andre, who are psychologists. Um, uh, Marco Gubi, uh, who is a professor in computer science, and Antonio Hockey, who is in physics. Uh, so we had a very uh, interdisciplinary team, uh, and I believe this this it, it was very helpful for for coming up with the model and, and thinking about several interesting aspects. Okay, so uh, the talk will be organized. Uh, I will firstly give a short introduction uh, about what how how the goalkeeper game works and what were the problems that we had uh, in, in using it for predicting some variables. Then I'll talk about the statistical model that we de developed and, and how we uh, used, uh, uh, how we estimated its parameters. Uh, statistical model just for the goalkeeper game, right? And then I'll, ta I'll talk about how we use this statistical model for the goalkeeper game to finally classify some variables that were related to Parkinson's disease. And then I'll, I'll, I'll discuss some limitations of, the, of this model and, and some possible ways to improve it. Okay, so our goal from the beginning was how can we use the data from the goalkeeper game, which is uh, complex in, in some way, uh, not, not, not that uh, easy to use uh, using the standard machinery in statistics to predict some clinical variables that are related to Parkinson's disease. And specifically in this uh, research, we were interested in, in predicting a variable that is related to how a, a person walks in complex situations, which is a DGI, the type of gait index. And uh, besides collecting data from DGI, each one of the participants who were about 60 participants uh, played the goalkeeper game. So the goalkeeper game is organized in, in several uh, stages. And in each one of these stages, the person has to perform uh, some type of activity. So there's the motor baseline stage, which is the first one uh, which appears in this in the top right uh, left part of this figure and we can see that in this stage the only thing that the person has to do is type the same direction that appears in the screen so this is probably not very relevant stage it's, it's mostly there to understand if the person understands how to use the interface and, and can follow simple steps in the goalkeeper game so we use the, the motor baseline mostly as, a, as an exclusion criterion. If the person, uh, the, he had to try uh, five uh, different directions, 
uh, and if he couldn't get at least three of these directions correct, then we excluded this person from the study. But I believe that only one or two uh, of the subjects were excluded from the, the study. Next, there was a learning state phase. And this learning phase had two types uh, of, of uh, inputs. So in one of them, uh, which was implicit, uh, there, there's the, the, the person who is kicking at the goal and the person who is playing is the goalkeeper. And he doesn't know in which direction the person is gonna is gonna kick at, and he has to choose left, center, or right. And and the the, the kicker has a certain algorithm, and and the person has to predict what what algorithm the person is using to kick. Uh, and and there are two types of ways in which this happens. In one of them, the the person has no type of hint. So he just has to predict what, what type of sequence is happening following, following what, his memory. Um, and in this one, uh, the, the person tried eight times. So the kicker kicked eight times and the, and the person playing had to guess as the goalkeeper eight, eight times. And in the second type uh, of case, the, the, the past uh, attempts of the kicker appeared in the screen as a visual help, and then the goalkeeper had to do the, the same activity. And for this stage, <clears throat> uh, he had 12 attempts at guessing the sequence. And then finally, there's the memory phase. So in the memory phase, the complete sequence appeared uh, on the screen, and the person had uh, to memorize the, the whole sequence, and then the sequence would uh, disappear, and then the goalkeeper would have to repeat the sequence that was used by the kicker. Uh, so in the end, uh, we didn't use for predictive purposes the, the Moser baseline step. We only used the two types of the learning phase and the memory phase. So we had three uh, stages, and in each one of these stages, we had a, a variable number of attempts. And uh, there were two extra uh, stages in the learning phase in which instead of a deterministic algorithm, the kicker actually used a, a random algorithm, uh, which followed the Markov chain. But since the, 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 the people who were engaged, the, the participants, usually performed really badly in this stage, uh, the, the, this, the, these uh, other two stages, which had randomness, were not incorporated into this study. Uh, it, the goalkeeper game was later uh, refined, and in so this is we used data from 2017, and then we later collected more data from 2018. Uh, and and in these, the the random phase was adapted so that we we believe that. Uh, they were made easier for humans to understand and probably uh, so that we can better get information from these stages. But for this study from 2017, we only used the deterministic learning phases and the memory phase. Okay, so uh, once we described what's actually happening, we have some natural covariates, so natural variables that appear in the goalkeeper game. We have this variable Z, uh, which is the response of player J in attempt T at stage E of the goalkeeper game. So what does this mean? G is one of the, of the 60 players. J is one of the 60 players. So it's a variable uh, index that can go from 1 to 60. Then E, the stage E, is one of the three stages that I described in the pre previous slide. So it can be the learning phase, implicit or explicit, or it can be the memory phase. And each one of these uh, stages has several attempts. The kicker will kick several times. So for example, in the learning phase one, the kicker kicks eight times. And for each one of these eight kicks, you have one of the one attempt. 
So the variable t for, for learning phase one can, can go from one to eight. And then WET is the correct response in attempt T at stage E of the goalkeeper game. So W would be what was actually performed by the kicker, and Z is what the player performed as the goalkeeper. So without thinking too much, these are variables that appear naturally in the problem. And each one of the W and Z can, can assume one of three variables. Uh, one of three values, right? So center, left, or right. So what happens in this context? We have uh, approximately 100 covariates per player, right? So uh, the covariates are actually what, what the player uh, is performing, right? The whole time series. And, and uh, so how do we get to approximately 100? We have eight plus 12, 20 plus 30 in the memory phase. We have uh, 50. And then we have uh, three state. Uh, oh, and then we have W, right? So that uh, multiplies by two. So we had uh, approximately 100 covariates per player. And we can see that we have 60 players. So we have more covariates than sample size. If we, if we are looking at each player, we will have uh, some variable that we want to predict. predict. So it's, 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 it looks like a high dimensional setting. And in a high dimensional setting, we have to take a lot of care with the curse of dimensionality and think very carefully whether we want to use complex models or not. So in the beginning, when we were brainstorming, we were thinking about several very uh, complex models of how people actually learn. So we, we, we were thinking about putting some forgetting parameters, uh, learning parameters. Uh, maybe we, we, we will use some, uh, the, pro the person was trying to learn a tree and then he could try have uh, pruning parameters. Uh, he could maybe act in similar as a, in a Bayesian fashion and then we could try to add that to the model. But we see that we already have 100 covariates. So if we add a lot of complexity, we might, uh, we might get into trouble. Uh, and a lot of this presentation is uh, focused on this. What type of trouble can happen? So what, what can go on? on? Uh, I put a very, uh, very uh, known sl uh, slide. Uh, that uh, highlights the problem with uh, complex models. So we can see that there's uh, uh, several points that are observed, and we are trying to, to fit these points with a curve. And it looks like more or less a parabola of some sort, a curve that, that is convex. Um, and we can see that if we try to fit a parabola with a straight line, a straight line only has two parameters. It's too simple to, to fit this, this complicated data. Then there's a, a, a middle figure in which we can see that a, there's a type of curve that doesn't go through all of the points. It's a little bit more complicated than a parabola. There's a little bit of squig squiggliness. It's, it, it's a good fit between the complexity of the data and the complexity of the model. And then finally, we can see a curve that has so many parameters that it can completely fit all of the data, uh, all of the data that that we see. It, it passes through each one of these points, or almost all of them, except for one of them. And we can see that if we use this the, this curve, then it's very squiggly. It's uh, very hard to understand it, and it probably performs very badly because. Although in the points that we see, it, it has zero error or very small error, in the points that we don't see, we believe that it's, it will probably commit a, a very big error because uh, we don't believe that the curve is so, so uh, complicated. So it's very dangerous to add too many parameters to the model because, uh, or add, or to, and, and don't control what's going on, 
uh, make if we add uh, a huge dimension to the model and don't control for for this, then we we have a risk of getting into the third type of picture in which we are feeding a very uh, irregular curve uh, and performing very badly. So since we have 60, our sample size is 60, and we already have 100 covariates, we have to take some time to find how can we simplify these, these covariates, get less covariates, so that we can fit a useful model. OK. So the first thing that we did was just a, a simple simplification. We call this variable x the indicator that player j in his uh, teeth at attempt at stage e answered correctly. So x is just a sequence of zeros and ones. Zero if the person uh, got the sequence wrong, and one if the, the person got the sequence correctly at that attempt. So we can see that this already cuts out a lot of the structure from the problem. So in the problem originally, there, there, there was a deterministic sequence or, or in the random stage, there was a Markov chain. Uh, and it was based on three uh, types of inputs, right? Left, center, or right. And here, we, we restrict ourselves just to zero or one, correct or not correct. Uh, and we simplify the data a lot. We, we also had Z, what the person actually uh, guessed, and W, which was the correct element of the sequence. And we eliminate these two variables and only look at X. So we don't care about what was the correct element of the sequence. We only look if the person guessed correctly or not. OK, so using this transformation, now we only have binary variables. And instead of 100 variables, we have 50 variables per person. It's, we still have 50 variables for about 60 players, so it's still too much. We, we still have to simplify or extract more information to these variables before we can, we can do any type of useful predictive uh, model. And each one of these axes is probably very low informative because it's, it's just a bit of information, right? Just 0 and, and 1. So probably we can look at the aggregate of these axes and try to extract from these aggregate variables uh, a single parameter that will give us more information about the general behavior of this player. So the idea of what we are trying to do is uh, exempl exemplified in this figure. So here, uh, there's a figure of, a, a, uh, of the probability of a person uh, guessing correctly after, uh, so in the x axis, we have the number of attempts of the person. And then in, in the y axis, we have the probability that the person guesses correctly. So it's the probability that x is equal to 1. So we can see that this curve has a, a, some important variables that, that appear, some important parameters, and some important features. So the first thing that we can see is that when x is equal to 1, the, prob the probability is up, uh, close to one third. It's not close to 0 because uh, the y-axis is, is not, does not start at, at 0. You can follow it by the, the rectangles that appear in the, in the, in the uh, uh, below below the curve. So uh, you can see that at, at stage one, the curve assumes a value of close to one third. And this happens because uh, when the person sees nothing, what can he do? There's nothing better than guessing center left or middle, uh, uh, center left or right. And there are three options. He doesn't know what the kicker is going to do. So at, st at, at attempt one, he has no nothing better than guessing randomly. So his probability of getting it uh, correct, this element, is one third. Then we can see that the curve, it's when, when the number of attempts increases a lot, it goes to 0, 07. This doesn't have, need to happen for every player. 
but it should be a parameter of our model. So after the person sees a sequence for a very long time, what is the probability that he will get a new, a new element of the sequence correctly? So we call this the asymptotes of the learning curve or the person's, the person's asymptotes of his learning. And then there's a final parameter of how fast the curve increases to, to the asymptote, which is the derivative of, of the curve, right? And uh, we call this, this third parameter the learning rate of the person. So there's the learning rate and the asymptote of learning. Uh, and we, so this is the type of thing that we were trying to model. It already simplifies a lot of what's going on in, in the person's mind, but we have to try to simplify a lot due to our small sample size. We have to try to already do some of the heavy lifting of, of information extraction for our model. And an interesting thing that, that also occurs in, in this type of data. So here in the y-axis, uh, we have uh, a measure of performance of each one of the of the persons and in the colors we have the education of the person and we can see that the education uh, can influence uh, in a significant way the person's performance so we pr should probably use education as a control type of variable if we if we don't want to uh, lead our model to confusion so we we intend to do a low dimensional mapping of the uh, of our model uh, of the of the variables in the goalkeeper game uh, into some parameters that that we believe would carry more information about the general behavior of the person and we will call these parameters beta gamma and t so beta is the learning rate that i was describing in, in, uh, previously uh, and what it does is see how fast the person converges to, to, to the limits of his learning. And we have one variable beta for each player and for each stage of the learning uh, of the goalkeeper game. Then there's this gamma, which is the learning asymptote, which is after the person plays a sufficient amount of time, what is the probability that you will get the next uh, element of the sequence correctly? And we also have one of these for each player and one of these for each stages of the learning uh, of the goalkeeper game. And then finally, there's this capital T, which we didn't extract from a model. It's just a simple variable that is the average time that was spent by each player in which one, one of the stages of the game. But there's always a little tweak here and there. So in the first attempt of the person, there's, there's some uh, systematic type of biases. So sometimes the person doesn't understand the game and then he asks for the, the person who is applying the game for additional information. And then it can lead his first attempt to take a very long time, which will completely dominate the average. So we excluded, we always excluded the amount of time that was spent in the first attempt of the player. So uh, to, to get more relevant types of, of, of data. And then finally, we have a model that predicts what's the probability that the, per, uh, the, per, the person attempts has a cor uh, correct attempt using the parameters beta and gamma. So we used the probability that the person uh, co uh, answers correctly, correctly as, uh, as a type of curve, as, as this curve that I showed here. And it looks very much like the curve that appears in logistic regression but it has a little tweak that is different. So in, lo in logistic regression, which I will explain uh, later, what happens is that as the number of attempts increases, uh, the asymptote, so the limit of the curve, always goes to one. And here we don't want this ne to necessarily occur. The, the learning asymptote is, a, is an important parameter that we would like to model. So instead of using a, 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 lo a logistic regression, and, and the logistic regression is the, is the type of expression that appears in the right side of the equation. So it's the exponential divided by one plus the exponential. 
we also added uh, this gamma multiplying the, the logistic reg regression expression. And this gamma allows our curve in the limit to go to, to a value that is different from one. Then in the, in the logistic regression, we have this lambda that appears. And the lambda is usually a linear term. And, and it, it means that uh, the odds of the log of the odds of, of correctly uh, guessing uh, in, in the goalkeeper game, the log of the odds increases linearly with time. And, and the log of the odds is precisely this lambda term. Uh, and, and how does it behave? The lambda term, so it's, it's indexed by t, right? So time or the number of attempts is t. And we can see that t only appears multiplying beta, right? So it's a linear term that has uh, the derivative, right? The slope of this, of this curve, of, the, of this uh, uh, straight line is, is defined by beta. That's why beta is the learning rate in our model. And then there's this, finally, this log term uh, in the right of the, of, of the definition of lambda. And it's not extremely relevant. It's just a term that, that guarantees that the probability at time one will be one third, right? So we don't have to interpret this. It's just uh, a fixed term that guarantees that the probability at, at stage at uh, attempt one will be one third. And then the most important part is to observe that lambda increases linearly with beta as the number of, with the number of attempts. And then the probability uh, follows something that is similar to uh, logistic regression, but with this extra gamma parameter that allows us to model the learning asymptote. So this is the term that is responsible for the likelihood. And we also did uh, some uh, Bayesian uh, regularization. So uh, the beta term, which is the learning rate, we, we said that it's uh, drawn from a normal random variable, which has as mean uh, a, a, a value that depends on the education of the person. So each education, is each, each level of education uh, is, is responsible for a pooling of the beta parameters, a regular, so each one, so every, uh, people with the same education are reinforced to have similar learning rates. And then the, the, these learning rates that are responsible for education, uh, that come from education, which come from this alpha parameter, uh, they are drawn from a normal random variable standard Gaussian random variable. And this specifies the, the prior that is used uh, so that we can obtain some type of regularization. And we are giving information that people with similar educations probably behave in a similar way while playing the goalkeeper game, which we had reason to believe after seeing uh, these slides. OK. So this is the, the model that, that we used uh, to extract uh, variables from the goalkeeper game. Uh, and we fit this model using STAN. So STAN is a, is a software uh, that was developed by uh, a, a team that is uh, guided by Andrew Gelman at the University of Columbia. Uh, and, and they implemented Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, which is a type of Markov chain Monte Carlo, but uh, it's based on, on uh, uh, some ideas of physics that, uh, that improve the convergence of the posterior. So basically it's a type of, uh, of uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo that is guaranteed uh, or with high probability moves in the derivative of the of the posterior in the gradient of the posterior so it 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 
it has a smart way of trying to converge uh, or, or to approximate to the high, high density points of the posterior distribution. Okay. So after we fit this model with Stan, we have a posterior for these parameters. We have a posterior for beta, the learning rate, and a posterior for gamma, the asymptote of learning. And then we had we had to simplify this again so, do, so that we have a low dimensional mapping. So for each player in each stage, we, we looked at uh, each one of these parameters, for example, beta, and we took the average of this posterior. And the average of this posterior is finally a number that we obtained. So for each player uh, and each stage of the goalkeeper game, there are two important variables, beta and gamma. And for each one of these variables, we got a number, which was the average of the posterior for this player. So now what happened? Uh, now we have uh, nine, uh, per, uh, nine uh, covariates for each player. We have because we have three stages, and for each one of these three stages, we have three parameters: beta, gamma, and t, which was the average of time that was used. And finally, we have this variable y, which is the indicator that GGI of player J is above or below the median. So y is just a binary random variable, and we want to try to predict y using. Uh, these covariates that I, I called here JG, uh, GJ, uh, which is just these nine covariates that I that I explained, uh, and then we will try to fit some sparse classifiers. And then here again, we came to the problem. Okay, we we did all this trouble to get the variables from the goalkeeper game and to simplify them so that we had a, we didn't have 100 covariates per person. Now we have nine covariates per person uh, and, and we have 60, 60 people. So we have about a reasonable amount of covariates per person. But still, we believe that for some of these predictions, perhaps not all of the covariates are relevant. And we still can't you really uh, per, uh, try to use a very complicated classifier because we we still have a very limited sample size. So we have to look at a classifier that has a good balance between complexity and uh, and predictive power. So we, we really tried uh, to start with a penalized logistic regression. So we have uh, the probability that uh, for player J, the his DGI is uh, above the median, this probability will be given by a logistic regression. So it's just exponential over one plus the exponential, uh, and this probability looks very much like the curve that I that I showed before. This curve here. The only difference is that when we take x, the the value of x going to infinity then this curve necessarily goes to one. And then we have this lambda j, uh, which is the, the, log, the log of the odds of this probability. And it's just uh, this, this, the lambda j is just a linear uh, expression, right? It's some parameter de delta that has inner product with the, the covariates, the nine covariates that we extracted, which were the GJs. So this is just a straight line. And then the straight line is transformed by the logistic expression to become a curve like the one that we saw before. And then we have one of these probabilities for each one of the, of the participants in the goalkeeper game. So we can finally compute the likelihood of, of the our observed data which is just a product of which one of these expressions that are given by the logistic regression. And then, okay, uh, we, we have nine, par nine parameters in this model and we have 60, uh, 60 participants. So one thing that we could try to do is search for the nine values of the parameters 
that would maximize the likelihood or maximize the log likelihood, which is the same thing. But still, we probably can improve uh, this, 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 this behavior by penalizing the number of parameters. So in, instead of maximizing the, the likelihood, we add a penalty term, which is ho times the, the uh, absolute error loss of, of the parameters. And this type of penalization, it uh, enforces uh, sparsity. Uh, so it enforces so, uh, uh, a type of solution in which some of the parameters that are not useful for predictions are uh, become zeros. And then there's the question, okay, we added a new parameter here, which is this whole variable. How do we choose this whole variable, which is the amount of sparsity that we want to select? Well, we, we can't keep adding more and more parameters. One way of doing this is choosing the value of whole by cross-validation. So what do we do? We, we fix a grid of holes, and for each one of the elements in this grid, we choose, let's say, whole equals 0, 2. And for whole equals 0, 2, we leave one of the samples out, so one of the participants is left out, and then we fit, fit the model without this participant. And with the fitted model, we guess whether the person will correct this, this person that was left out, we'll guess whether he would correctly, uh, uh, he, he would guess correctly at this attempt or not. Uh, or, or sorry, we guess whether his DGI is above the median or not. And then we, we, we annotate whether the model uh, per, uh, got its uh, correct prediction for this or not. And then for this value of four, we can look at the average of the correct predictions using this type of uh, 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 validation. And then we can do this for each one of the values of four and the value of four that most gets the most values of correct predictions is the value of four that we will choose, and it's the value of two that will probably have the best predictive power. And then finally, we we fit the model using the complete data using this value of whole. And then we did this type of cross validation, and once we did this type of cross validation, we fitted uh, the following parameters for the. Uh, for predicting the the, the, GG, the the value of DGI. And we can see that there are three values of the parameters that are zero, that assume the value exactly zero. This occurs precisely because we added a, a penalty term uh, that enforced sparsity, the L1 loss. Then besides these values that are zero, we have some values that assume a very large value, like beta 3 and gamma 3. Beta 3 and gamma 3 are, uh, 3 refers to the stage. So the stage that has the largest uh, values uh, in absolute value is the memory phase of the learning, of the goalkeeper game. So we found some evidence that the memory phase was being uh, the phase that has had the largest predictive value for the for the DGI, and and what what how do we interpret these parameters? For example, gamma three is looking at the uh, at the at the asymptote of learning, right? So the larger the asymptote of learning of the person, the higher the probability that the person will have a DGI uh, above average, and in particular, the, if we increase the asymptote of learning by 0.1, then the, we expect that on average, uh, the log of the odds that the person guesses correctly will be increased by 0.22. And beta 3 is the learning rate of the person, which is, has a negative value here, right? So the higher the learning rate of the person in the memory phase, uh, the lower the log odds of him guessing correctly will be. And then, so the memory phase appeared as the one that had the largest values, 
And then probably the, the, the other values that appear in the model, so the, the, the learning phase, implicit and explicit, the coefficients are so small that they might not, although they are not zero, they might not be very significant, uh, uh, significant for interpreting the model. But you can see, for example, that the time variables have negative coefficients. That means that the less time the person uh, spends, on average, the higher will be the, the log odds uh, of uh, the log odds of correctly having a correct attempt. So the interpretation is reasonable. And then, oh, it, it, for some reason, it's not appearing in the slide, but this model had a 65% of accuracy. This means that uh, on average, the model uh, will correctly uh, guess, correctly predict whether the DGI of the person is below or above uh, the, uh, the median 65% of the times. And accuracy has some, some problems uh, in a, for us to understand. Look, only when looking at the accuracy, it's, it's not always easy to understand whether a model performs well or not. So one of these problems occurred recently in, in a challenge that, uh, to Kaggle that was posted by Albert Einstein Hospital, uh, in which we had to use variables to guess whether a person had COVID uh, or not. And the problem with accuracy happens when we have a, a large unbalance between the, the, the categories in, in our sample. So, for example, in this COVID, uh, in this COVID challenge, uh, approximately 95% of the sample did not have COVID. So, if 90% of the sample does not have COVID, and you only and you put a classifier that says no, no matter what I see, the person does not have COVID, then the classifier will guess correctly 95% of the times, right? Because it will correctly guess at everybody who doesn't have COVID and incorrectly guess at everybody who has COVID. But it's the scientific relevance of this classifier is clearly nothing, right? Anyone could come up with, not even looking at the data, this classifier that says that no one has COVID. Oh, and even though it's irrelevant from a statistical point of view, its accuracy is 95%, which looks high, right? So accuracy is very dangerous measure, especially when you have an imbalance of, of categories. So uh, instead of only looking at the accuracy, we also looked at the rock curve, which is a receiver operator curve, uh, which, which we show here. So besides the goalkeeper game, we also try to use the MOCA exam as a, another type of covariate that was, that was fitted in parallel. And we use the MOCA just to compare whether a goalkeeper game could perform better than another, another variable, right? And the receiver uh, operator curves, it shows to us, okay, for each one of the cutoffs, so at the end of our model, our model might, might come up with a probability that the person uh, has COVID or a probability that the person is below or above the, uh, the median uh, DGI value, right? So let's say that the probability is 0.6. Uh, we can say, okay, if a person has probability 6, we might say that the person has COVID or that the person... Rafael, Rafael, excuse me, maybe should define what, what is the receiver operator curve. Oh, I'm trying to do that now. Okay. okay. So for uh, after we adjust a classifier or a soft classifier, like in the case of logistic regression, for each person, we have a probability that the y variable assumes the value one, right? Right. So the 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 probability that he has a above average DGI. So let's say for this person, the probability that his DGI is above average is 0.6. We we can choose whether 0.6 will be classified as above average or below average. A natural type of, 
uh, of cutoff would be if the probability of DGI is greater than 0.5, then we will say that he's above average. And if the probability is below 0.5, we will so say that he's below average. But this is just a single cutoff. It's not necessarily the best cutoff, right? So what, what happens in this, in this figure? For each one of the possible cutoffs, the, the model tells us two important features. One of the features is that the model correctly uh, guesses a person, correctly predicts a person, given that he's above average. And the second, uh, which appears in the y-axis, right? And the second one uh, is the probability that the model uh, correctly guesses uh, the, the DGI of the person, given that he's below average, and this appears in the x-axis. Or one, one minus this variable appears in the x-axis. So we would like this curve to be very, uh, uh, to be on, uh, the farthest away on top from, from a straight line, because the straight line is a curve that we can get uh, with no information at all, right? If we if if we just say uh, flip a car, uh, re generate a, 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 a random number between zero and one for for the probability that uh, the the person uh, has uh, a DG, a, G, above average DGI, and we and we for each one of these values we specify a, a cut, then we will get a straight line as the rock curve. And the farthest away from above that this curve is from the straight line, the better the predictive value of our variables. And then there's a trade-off about how much you want to predict correctly the people who, who have below average DGI and how much you want to guess correctly the, person, the people who have above average DGI. So as extremes, you always have uh, the classifier that uh, says that everybody has above average DGI, and it does very well in people who have above average DGI, in very badly on, on people who have below average DGI. And you have the opposite classifier that has says that everybody has below average DGI, and it performs very well for people who have below average DGI, and very badly for people who have above average DGI. So that's the important why we have to look these two classifiers just appear in the extremes of this of the, of the curve but then we have more sensible classifiers in the middle that for give for a given probability let's say 0.6 if the person has probability greater than 0.6 they say that the the dgi is above average and if the probability is, is below 0.6 they say that the probability the person is has below average dgi and one for each one of these cutoffs and that's how we build the curve. And we can see here that uh, the goalkeeper game, this curve is, uh, it looks sensibly different from the straight line, while Mocha doesn't look sensibly different from a straight line. So GG uh, has a lot of uh, information for predicting DGI, and it, it performs better than Mocha at predicting DGI. Uh, it's a little bit hard to explain this curve, but maybe if 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 there if there are any doubts, I, I can go back to this uh, during questions. Uh, okay, so uh, this was just a very simple model for for trying to predict uh, variables that are related to Parkinson's disease using the goalkeeper game, and we saw that there's an important part in simplifying the type of data that we get from the goalkeeper game. And there appears, uh, but but it, it was a, just a simple initial step. So we could try, and we are trying at the moment, to make this model a little bit more complicated and to capture more information that uh, people, uh, act uh, that actually is encoded in the behavior of people. So one thing that happened is that we only used a type of hard classification uh, of, so if the person guessed correctly or incorrectly, that's how we build the X variables. But now we have a random stage uh, in which there's 
there's a probability that the person will guess correctly. The kicker doesn't have a deterministic behavior. So we could try to uh, put a soft classification instead of just if the person, instead of just putting if the person, whether the person guessed correctly or not, we could say uh, how far is the person's guess from the optimal probability of, of choice, right? So we could penalize the person using a Breyer score or something like that, instead of just putting ones or zeros. After, uh, also besides this, uh, mistakes are very uh, relevant in the way a person behaves. So uh, if a person commits a mistake when he believes that he's, he should be correct, when he believes that he learned a pattern, then that can impact significantly how he uses time in trying to uh, improve his model, right? And we did we, the only type of uh, time that we use on, on how much uh, on on the person's decision making is just the average amount of time that we we used. So we could try to further improve this in understanding how a person reacts to his mistakes and how how uh, what type of strategy he uses, uh, how how he how well he uses his time in in dealing with these mistakes. So what type of strategic behavior he has? Can, does he, whenever he guesses incorrectly, does he use a lot of time or does he never use time and he just goes very fast? Or uh, in the beginning when he uh, guesses incorrectly, he, he, he uses a lot of time, but later on, once he believes strongly that he learned the law, even after he commits a mistake, he doesn't use that much of time. These are some of the aspects that could be improved and could add more information to, to our model. So that's the type of thing that we are trying to work on now. Simon, I, I ran a little bit late, so maybe I miss a little bit uh, in the beginning, but so um, hopefully my question is not stupid. So, uh, I wonder actually the, in, the, in your results, what, how you think that you would be able to dissect a little bit of the cognitive aspect of the um, of the goalkeeper test because I understand that the, you can use to classify and um, and use for uh, to help in diagnosis of the, of the Parkinson disease. But I wonder if you can actually uh, try to understand what what kind of process uh, could be uh, affected by the disease actually using the goalkeeper, goalkeeper. So in fact, you can include in the model something that is related to some cognitive aspect of the, of the disease. Mm -hmm. um, so we try to directly predict the stage of the, of the Parkinson's disease, which was Hoenyard. And, and using the goalkeeper game, we didn't get a good predictor for, for Hoenyard. At, at least at, with that, with the type of data that we used, but when you add is not is not cognitive, right? It's just mo motor. Uh, so it seems that the, the goalkeeper game is really uh, getting some type of of cognitive behavior that is changed by Parkinson's disease, uh, and, and 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 and, and we, which is not directly captured by Hoenyard. And this is one of the things that Maria, Maria Lisa, who who came, who, who bring the problem, she she said that it's not that interesting to predict well Hoenyard because that's already done easily and uh, by 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 a, a doctor. Uh, and and the important far, part is really getting this cognitive uh, development of Parkinson's disease uh, before it happens. If someone knows better than me, please correct me. But Hoenyard is just an index uh, of Parkinson's disease that can go from one to three. Uh, and then it, 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 uh, it, it shows how much the motor behavior of the person is affected by, by Parkinson's disease. So for Hoenyard 1, only one side of the body is affected. For Hoenyard 2, the two sides of the body are affected. And for Hoenyard 3, I'm not really sure, but I think that then it, it's, it severely uh, affects the, the motor behavior of a person.
this is a very simple model, right? You saw, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, 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 a lot of trouble that I had was really simplifying all the information that we have in the goalkeeper game, so that we didn't, uh, we didn't have too many parameters for too few sample units. So we only mm -hmm. had sixty sample units. And in mm -hmm. the end, even after every all the simplifications that I did, I only had I I still had about ten covariates, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I I don't know how how I would add this this covariate mm -hmm. that that captures what type of cognitive impairment the person has. We also mm -hmm. we also have mocha the mocha exam, and we we try to complement add the mocha exam as uh, also as a predictor and try to use the goalkeeper game to predict mocha mocha scores but this didn't didn't work very well i see uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, I, I don't know does this does this answer your question yeah uh, yeah definitely uh, uh i have sorry one one more it's a question also a little bit of maybe observation that then uh obviously i don't know i um I think it should get the data sets from people with the um, with disease will be really difficult to have a, a high number of, of, of data points. Right? But the, I was wondering for control, like for the for for control uh, subjects, I always thought that maybe this goalkeeper um, uh, the game can be used. You can use in the mechanical Turk maybe you know the, the amazon mechanical turk and try to get a huge amount of data set do you think that's possible okay it seems well the the goalkeeper game uh, i guess gubi and uh, maybe antonio know better than me uh, mm -hmm. the goalkeeper game has a platform for mobile devices so yes yes probably you you can get a, a mm -hmm. lot of a lot of control data and maybe using amazon mechanical turk uh, yeah. But then, okay, let's say we have a lot of this data. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. How do we extract these these useful variables related to cognitive performance? Well, Gubi is actually working on on this, maybe uh, mm -hmm. on, on on some type of model that could capture this. So he he was trying to build some type of uh, automata, but that that uses the past sequence. But has some traits that are more similar to a human. So let's mm -hmm. say that he he starts forgetting some of the sample with a given parameter, or mm -hmm. or has some of these behaviors. Uh, maybe this is more or less what you are thinking about. I'm not sure. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. And uh, but but I totally get that the, probably with the with this sample size would be difficult to make a more co uh, uh, complex model. Right? So then I thought maybe if you use mechanical Turk and get a lot of data, so maybe you can do something. But yeah, I understand that. Mm -hmm. Daniel, so, what yeah. what is this Amazon mechanical Turk? I yeah, so know. sorry. Yeah, so I want to. So actually, this is actually already um, it's something that is now very popular among uh, psychologists and. I think worldwide, but especially in US. But essentially, you can use um, a platform that Amazon made available where you can actually uh, hire. So you have to pay usually. Right? It's a small amount, but you pay a small amount per person per game, like uh, I don't know, one cent, one cent of dollar or something like this. And then uh, these people essentially will play set. Uh, you will get a, a, a huge number of people in a very short time. You know, like a huge number mean like a thousands of people in a very short time window. You know? So it's a platform where you can, for example, upload a game or upload some tasks, and the people can just play, and then they will get a little bit of money, but also you will get the data set. So that's the idea. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, the idea would be to put the goalkeeper game in this platform. No? That would be one possibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that you will get actually a huge. No the 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 main uh, the main uh, advantage of this platform that you get really a high number of people, like really in the thousands, in a very short time window. The caveat. Okay. Obviously, is that you usually cannot control so well the quality of the data set, right? so you will have to make some. Essentially, you have to put a lot of uh, criteria to make sure that they are doing really the game, right? Correctly. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I wanted to know, actually, uh, my question, I think, addresses a similar question as uh, Danielle's question. I wanted to know how, how do you really know you're uh, actually measuring the motor effect with the goalkeeper game? As we know that in Parkinson's disease uh, patients, they have a compensation like a uh, cognitive uh, compensation for uh, the like strato impairments. So I wanted to know how you know you're actually measuring the motor compound of the brain activation with the goalkeeper game? Well, I'm not sure I understood the question, but if I answer uh, something that is not relevant, please, please let me know. Uh, okay. So what uh, we are, we are, we are trying to measure some type of uh, cognitive impairment uh, with the with the goalkeeper game, right? Um, and the way that we validate our model is in two ways. First, uh, uh, the uh, Maria Elisa and and Andrea and, and Antonio Hockey, who who know uh, the the relevant sciences. They, 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 they interpreted the model and they, they could uh, relate the memory phase to, to the behavior of, of these people. But from a statistical point of view, uh, we, we used cross-validation, right? So we are not using, we don't use the data to predict the behavior of a person. And if we, if we weren't actually capturing information, we would expect that our, our model wouldn't be able to predict correctly, accurately predict a person without using that, that person's information. And since it, it can predict the value of a person without looking, looking at, 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 his, at, at his attempts, uh, so it, it can predict whether the DGI index of a person will be below or, or above the average, without looking at, at his DGI index, then the model must be capturing some information uh, that is relevant for predicting DGI. Uh, but it, but uh, it, it doesn't, it, uh, if we do the same thing for, let's say the whole NER index, then it, it doesn't perform well, its predictions don't perform well. So the model adequately uh, predicts DGI, but not whole NER. Uh, so actually, it, it doesn't seem like the model is capturing uh, information information that is relevant for predicting the the motor activities of a person. Uh, I'm not sure if I answered your question or not, Anato. Yeah, I, I guess uh, you did. I thought uh, I think I understand. I understood uh, wrong previously because I thought as you were trying to understand. Uh, the gait pattern, uh, you were trying to measure the motor component of uh, the brain activation. So I think I understood wrong previously. Uh, it, it is it is the gait performance. Uh, now is the this is the part that I I don't understand so well. But it's uh, it's it's the gait uh, performance under some complex uh, situations. And then uh, Maria Elisa believed that there's not only uh, there, there is a, of course a, a motor behavior, but there's also uh, something related to autom autom. I don't know how to translate to English well, but automaticity. Oh, I uh, think I think you answered perfect uh, perfectly my question because that's actually what I was talking about. That uh, the patients they have like a compensation. They have many comp uh, cognitive compensations for the facts in motor uh, activation. So actually I understand now that you're measuring both uh, motor and cognitive uh, activation related to gait. That's right? Yes, that I guess that that's, so the goalkeeper game, the, the this uh, this version of the goalkeeper game was developed by, by Antonio Roque, André Frazão, uh, Maria Elisa, Galvez, so that it would capture, it, it would be able to capture these compensation devices uh, that people who with Parkinson's disease use. So, for example, 
uh, one of the phases has has that uh, guideline in which the person can see what the what happened before and in the other stage the person doesn't have this this guideline uh, and, and we also measure uh, how much time the person spends uh, so uh, Maria Elisa always said that if a person doesn't have a, if a, a, a healthy person would just have an automatic behavior just pr pressing the correct sequence but it's very simple usually like zero one two zero one two zero one two he can do it very fastly not even look what he's doing while a person with okay. who is using a compensation device probably spends more time thinking about what's what 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 what's going on no you you answered my question perfectly thank you okay sure thanks uh good morning to everybody uh thank you rafael for your nice presentation um my, que my question is related to the learning asymptote you use in your model. Uh, the learning asymptote used in your model for the deterministic K is bounded by one, by one, right? Yes. So I yes. guess that for random sequence of stimuli, this bound changes, and it depends also on the variable length micro change used to generate the stimuli. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if this is a fact that you take into account in your model, I mean, in, in that model, which is a kind of extension of the logistic regression model, when you consider a random sequence of stimuli, as you mentioned that you are right now analyzing this kind of data, I, I was uh, wondering if this is a fact that you, that you have to consider in this model. That's, that's a good question. Uh, I believe, yes, you have to take it into account. If, if not, uh, even even if the model could, even if you don't directly take into account the model, even if the model could really be learned gamma, you want to help your model, right? You want to give it more information. And in, in, in these random cases, the learning rate certainly cannot be larger than than a given given amount. So, but but since we are using a Bayesian model, we can just change our prior, uh, and that that should be enough. Uh, to specify the, uh, uh, an upper bound on the gamma. Uh, in this stand uh, 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 language, you can easily constrain the values of a, of a random variable, let's say the gamma, and using these constraints, we, we can take this into account. But, but thanks for, for uh, telling me this. Uh, in the previous attempts I, I didn't take this into account I, in the next time i try to fit the model I, I will add these constraints thank you for the question also so i mean uh, as rafael explained uh, the dg uh, the goalkeeper game has three phases uh the second and third one were the most important for our, our study the second one is a more say cognitive oriented phase uh because it, it's related to, to implicit learning and uh, learning in general and the third phase is related to memory and uh, to our surprise initially uh, we found that the uh, variable that correlates better with the dgi score is memory is the third phase as rafael explained initially it was a surprise to us because we were seeking for some some learning some correlation between the learning phase and this because we thought that uh, uh, say that, say the high cognitive functions would be more important for this task but uh, uh, we, we found that memory is more important, uh, 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 and especially declarative and working memory, which are the, 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 the uh, resources that the, the person has to use to, to guess correctly the, in the third phase. Uh, so in, in a sense, that's the main, main message of our work. We found that memory uh, is, is the uh, aspect of the DGA uh, of the DG uh, game, uh, the goalkeeper game as it is now, th that can explain the behavior, uh, can explain the DGI score. Um, uh, and uh, so uh, th then we found later, I cannot, uh, if you go to the paper, you see that we give, give some references of experimental work that also uh, have found similar. Uh, 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 Things. Uh, this is uh, th those are records that were brought by by Maria Elisa. So uh, there are other studies that show that the declarative memory 
is related to gate performance and the complex conditions. Uh, so, in a sense, our result was is in agreement with other findings. But that's the thing. So there's a there's a cognitive component associated. But the, this cognitive component is not learning, but it's memory. So that's the main finding of this work. Of course, this is a preliminary work. We have to. Uh, Oh, Renata, uh, the paper is the paper, uh, is the title of the paper that. Uh, it, 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 it's, already, it's already on the website. It's in the website. If you go to the paper, you see it there in the discussion. I don't have the paper now, I have to open it. But anyway, we, 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 we comment that. As, as Rafael presented, the, the, the variable that correlates better with DJI performance is memory. This was initially surprising, but then we, we dig. In the literature, and we found some references, and we put that in the in the, in the final uh, uh, paragraph of, of the paper. If you go there, you can find that, Renata. So the answer to that, to Daniel's question is that yeah, indeed, there is a cognitive component related, but it's memory instead of learning. And to Renata, you go there and find it, you find the reference, um, and then you can also try to talk to Maria Lisa and Andrea. Uh, they could also uh, provide more, uh, say, a better answer than than mine uh, to this question. Okay, I hope I clarified a bit.